Today we're going to talk about Chapter 9 from our book, which is on basic between-subjects designs. Well, what is an experimental design? Uh, it is essentially the experimenter's plan for testing a hypothesis. Um, how do we test our research question? Well, it's really like the blueprint of a house. Uh, this is how I think about it. Uh, you can see how the rooms are connected, but not what the rooms are specifically going to be used for. So an experimental design gives you the structure of the experiment, but not the experiment's specific content. So you can use the same design to investigate different hypotheses. You can use different designs to investigate the same hypothesis. Okay, uh, You don't get the specific content from the design. It's determined by the experimental hypothesis, like I said. Um, how do we, de or the research question, how do we determine um, what our experimental design is? Well, really three factors. The first is the number of independent variables in the hypothesis. In general, the more independent variables that we uh, have, the more participants we need, and the more difficult it is to simultaneously manipulate multiple independent variables. So if we were doing a Red Bull study, again, first independent variable would be, say, Red Bull versus water. And the second independent variable, we might be interested in how people metabolize uh, caffeine. So it could be weight. That would be our second independent variable. So we take people under 150 pounds, people one over 150 pounds. Um, that could be our second independent variable. The second consideration is the number of treatment conditions needed to fairly test the hypothesis. So we could do our Red Bull study with two conditions, which would be Red Bull versus water, or three conditions. We could give one group of people four Red Bulls, another group of people two Red Bulls, and a third group of people just two glasses of water. Um, the more levels that you add, the more complicated your design becomes. The third determinant is whether we have the same people or different people in our treatment conditions. If you have the same people in each condition, that's what's called a within-subjects or within-groups design because we look for differences within each person. If we have different people in each treatment condition, then that is a between-subjects or between-groups design and we look for differences between our groups. That's where those terms are coming from. So what constitutes a between-subjects design? The person participates in only one condition of the experiment. In a within-subjects design, the person participates in every condition of the experiment. But uh, this chapter is about between-subjects or between-groups designs. We use those terms interchangeably. And in a between-subjects design, they're only in one condition. So, what determines whether we can generalize our findings? We like random sampling because it increases the experiment's external validity. Why? Well, uh, random sampling is getting your sample in such a way that each member of a population has an equal chance of being chosen on any given draw. Uh, the classical example of this is an army draft. Um, the reason why random sampling increases an experiment's external validity is because in the long run, random sampling approximates the population from which it's drawn. So, for example, again, in the Army they used to say it takes all kinds because the Army got a cross-section of the American population. Uh, so, like World War II or the Vietnam War. Um, people are chosen randomly, and so therefore... Um, in the long run, with a large enough sample, you're able to approximate the population. What's the minimum number of people for each group? 10 to 20, I would say really as many as possible. Um, 30 plus per treatment condition would be better. Uh, that would be, uh, I don't want to say minimum, because it really depends on the next slide, which is about effect size. Um, the effect size is your, uh, the magnitude of the effect of your independent variable. So, an independent variable like weight training has a very large effect size because it makes big changes in the people who are participating in it. 
And so you don't need a lot of people to show big, big gains in upper body strength. It determines the number of people who are in your group. So if you have a large effect, like uh, weightlifting or weight training, uh, you don't need as many people to show that effect. And so you might get by with 10 people per group. Uh, if your independent variable has a very small effect, you may have to have a lot of participants to show that. So you might need 60 people per group. Um, you can do uh, power analysis to figure out um, you know, how much of an effect you're going, your, your independent variable is going to have. Uh, power analysis is really more of a graduate school issue than it is a 200 level psychology class issue. What is a two group design? Uh, the creation of two separate groups of, of people. Um, this is the simplest type of design because it's only, uh, it only uses one independent variable and has two groups. So it's easy to understand, easy to do. Uh, what is that? What does that mean? Well, there's only one independent variable two, with two levels, and that could be an experimental group control group or a two experimental group design. So experimental control group, um, to continue with uh, the example I've been using, uh, it could be people who get two Red Bulls versus two waters. So the Red Bulls experimental group, the water is the control group. Um, the two experimental group design would be people who get four Red Bulls versus people who get two Red Bulls. And this is used a lot in drug treatment, not saying Red Bull is a drug, but um, you give people different levels of the drug rather than having a no treatment group. And so if you're testing schizophrenic or drugs for schizophrenia, uh, there is no control group, meaning that they don't get any, any drug whatsoever. You give them differential amounts of um, the drug you're interested in. The importance of random assignment. Uh, I cannot understate this, um, or overstate it, uh, I should say. Um, random assignment allows you to achieve group equivalence in between subjects, between groups designs. And uh, you assign subjects to conditions so that they have an equal chance of participating in either of the conditions. Okay, Departing from random assignment has huge internal validity issues. Um, how do they differ? Well, the experimental condition gets the independent variable. So the experimental condition, in our example, gets Red Bull, which means they get 80 milligrams of caffeine per Red Bull. And the control condition is a zero level of the independent variable. So in our situation, water, in which case you get zero milligrams of caffeine. So it is truly a zero level. Uh, a two independent groups design, uh, the experimental, this is, yes, by definition, this is correct. The two experimental groups design, um, you assign to one of two levels. Um, it talks about uh, this randomization issue. We can usually assume group equivalence with random assignment. Um, at least we act like we can. Um, so we, we use it to cure a lot of ills, um, this idea of random assignment. Uh, it works poorly with only 5 to 10 people per condition. <clears throat> well, you always want more participants than that. Uh, who runs a study with 10 to 20 people in it? Um, even with our weightlifting example, I was using 10 people per group. So you had 20 people in the study. But um, you always want to run at least 30 people per uh, treatment condition. Uh, deja vu uh, with this slide. Let's skip ahead to the matched groups design, the two matched groups design. So basically what we do is we match participants and then we put one in the experimental condition and one in the control condition. Um, we Matching is used to create groups that are equivalent. Uh, so you, instead of using random assignment, uh, well, you do randomly assign them to the experimental or control condition, though. So I don't want to uh, create that as a problem. The problem with matching, though, is that you can never be sure that we're matching on relevant subject variables. So maybe you match people on gender, but it's social class that's the relevant variable, or race. You can never really know. 
And so that's the issue with matching is we never, we're never really sure that we're matching on relevant or appropriate variables. Uh, what do you have to measure to form a match group's design? Well, uh, so let me give you an example. If we have a um, vocabulary task as our dependent variable, we might want to match people on intelligence because maybe that's something that we're interested in. And so um, how do we match people on intelligence? Well, uh, you could use precision matching. In precision matching, we insist on identical scores um, as if that IQ score was immutable and unchanging, which it is not. You could also use what's called range matching. This is far more common. What you do is you set a range, so let's say between 115 and 120. Um, these are really high IQ scores, by the way. Uh, average IQ is 100. So you could use uh, between 100 and 105, let's say, and match people based on that. So if you're in that range, um, you're matched. You could also do a rank ordered matching um, where you essentially put people in uh, uh, ordinal ranks and then match them based on that. The problem with it is that there could be huge differences between members of a pair. Um, I've never actually seen rank order matching used um, in the real world, but, you know. When should you use a two-matched group design? Well, um, this is oftentimes used in educational research because you can easily find variables to match on. So you can match students on grade level, IQ, test scores, gender, social class, race, whatever. And so it's easy to match people in educational research. So that's where those are, are frequently used. Um, what is the difference between a multiple groups and multiple independent groups design? Well, um, instead of, uh, uh, when we're talking about this, instead of a two group um, with a single independent variable, uh, we keep the single independent variable and have three or more groups. So as I talked about this earlier, uh, we might have different dosages of Red Bull, if you want to think of it as dosages. So some people get four Red Bulls, which is 320 milligrams of caffeine. Some people, a second group gets two Red Bulls, which is 180 milligrams of caffeine. And a third group gets uh, water, uh, which is zero milligrams of caffeine. And then uh, you get assigned to one of the three groups through random assignment. Block randomization is something that's hardly ever used anymore either. Um, it's an old technique from when statistics were done by hand. Um, the advantage of block random randomization is that you end up with equal numbers of people in each treatment condition. Um, that allows you to use simpler statistics than when you have unequal ends. But again, most statistics are done uh, on computers now, and it's not that much more difficult, uh, even when you're doing it by hand, to have unequal numbers of people in your treatment condition. So um, that's not right. It's solving a problem that really doesn't exist um, anymore. Um, how should you choose the number of treatments? Well, the overarching consideration is always the research question. That drives everything else. Um, and so that becomes um, part of the design. What are the practical limitations? Well, running multiple groups, uh, running a multiple groups design is complicated and complex. Okay, it just gives you more things that you have to juggle. So, time, expense, available number of people to be in your study. Um, so, we a lot of times we run pilot studies. Um, this is like the pilot of a TV show. Uh, if you if you know what that is, so they make one episode and they see how everybody likes it, and then they might decide to make more based upon that. Um, in experiments, pilot studies are great because they allow us to work out the problems in the experiment with just a few participants. And finally, uh, why are pilot studies great? Well, um, it, like I said, it lets you work out any problems. Um, pilot studies take time, but in the end, they save time, okay? It's, it's like when people say you should buy quality. Quality doesn't cost money, it saves money. Um, and so many people, many students don't want to do pilot studies because they're like, well, I just want to get to actually running the study. 
uh, it actually saves you time later because you're able to work out any problems. So, um, But that wraps up Chapter 9, and thanks for listening.